Hello, and welcome to Moments in History. I'm Linda Shenton Matchett, author, speaker, and history geek. While researching my stories, I unearth tons of intriguing historical information that doesn't end up in my books. So I've created this channel so that I can share those tidbits with you. I appreciate you stopping by to watch. The first woman in America to receive a medical degree, Elizabeth Blackwell, championed the participation of women in the medical profession and ultimately opened her own medical college for women. Born near Bristol, England on February 3, 1821, Elizabeth was the third of nine children of Hannah Lane and Samuel Blackwell, a sugar refiner, Quaker, and anti-slavery activist. Elizabeth's famous relatives included Brother Henry, a well-known abolitionist and women's suffrage supporter who married women's rights activist Lucy Stone, Emily Blackwell, who followed her sister into medicine, and sister-in-law Antoinette Brown Blackwell, the first ordained female minister in a mainstream Protestant denomination. When Elizabeth was 11, her father's refinery burned to the ground. The family moved to America in pursuit of business opportunities. They spent the next six years in New York City and the suburbs of Long Island and New Jersey. Elizabeth attended school and threw herself into the abolitionist movement, attending anti-slavery meetings and sewing for abolitionist fundraising fairs. In 1838, at the age of 17, with her father's new sugar refinery struggling, business prospects lured the family to Cincinnati. They were full of hope and eager anticipation, she wrote, but within a few months of arriving, her father died, leaving the family penniless. To provide for themselves, Elizabeth, her mother, and two older sisters worked in the predominantly female profession of teaching. Seven years later, she visited a close family friend dying of uterine cancer who spoke of how she had suffered at the hands of male doctors during her medical treatment. Why not study medicine, the friend asked. If I could have been treated by a lady doctor, my worst sufferings would have been spared me. The idea of winning a doctor's degree gradually assumed the aspect of a great moral struggle, Elizabeth wrote in her memoir, and the moral fight possessed immense attraction to me. Her teaching jobs took on new meaning, to earn money to fund her education. She took a post teaching music in South Carolina where she boarded with the family of a distinguished physician who gave her access to his vast medical library. She spent all her spare time studying. Soon, she applied to more than 20 medical schools and, unsurprisingly, was rejected by all of them. Fortunately, she had a mentor, an esteemed physician who wrote a letter on her behalf to Geneva Medical College in upstate New York. On October 20, 1847, Elizabeth received an acceptance letter that became one of her most cherished possessions. The letter explained that her acceptance had been put to a vote before the entire medical class, which voted affirmatively. Legend has it, they thought it was a joke. Elizabeth faced discrimination and obstacles in college. Professors forced her to sit separately at lectures and often excluded her from labs. Local townspeople shunned her as a bad woman for defying her gender role. She eventually earned the respect of professors and classmates, graduating at the head of her class in 1849, becoming the first woman to obtain a degree from a U.S. medical school. She continued her training at London and Paris hospitals, though doctors there relegated her to midwifery and nursing. She began to emphasize preventative care and personal hygiene, recognizing that male doctors often caused epidemics by failing to wash their hands between patients. During her two years at the clinics in London and Paris, she studied midwifery at La Maternité, where she contracted purulent ophthalmalia from a young patient, causing her to lose her sight in one eye. She returned to New York City, giving up her dream of becoming a surgeon. With the help of Quaker friends, she opened a small clinic to treat poor women. And in 1857, she opened the New York Infirmary for Women and Children with her sister, who by then was Dr. Emily Blackwell, as well as a colleague, Dr. Maria Zakaruska. The infirmary's mission included providing pos positions for women physicians. That same year, feeling lonely and isolated, she adopted a seven-year-old Irish girl named Kitty from an orphanage on Randall's Island. Kitty lifted Elizabeth's spirits. 
I feel full of hope and strength for the future, she wrote one sunny afternoon as Kitty played beside her with a doll. Who will ever guess the restorative support which that poor little orphan has been to me? In addition to running the infirmary during the Civil War, the Blackwell sisters trained nurses for Union hospitals. Several years later, after the war, she opened a medical school devoted entirely to training women. Adjacent to the infirmary and working closely together, the Women's Medical College of New York became one of the first four-year medical colleges in the country. Having earned a reputation for its rigor and excellence, after three decades, it became part of what is today Weill Cornell Medicine, which agreed to take all of its students. While in the U.S., Elizabeth campaigned heavily to get legislator approved to, to allow the admission of women to receive medical degrees, but the law would not pass until she had been in London for over a year. Her relationship with her sister deteriorated because of repeated disagreements about how the infirmary should operate. So she placed Emily in charge and returned permanently to London, where, in 1875, she became a professor of gynecology at the new London School of Medicine for Women. Additionally, she founded the National Health Society, which aimed to educate people about the benefits of hygiene and healthy lifestyles. Their motto, prevention is better than cure, is a phrase that is still used by medical professions and the general public today. At this time, she also published several books, including an autobiography entitled Pioneer Work in Opening the Medical Profession to Women, which was published in 1895. In her autobiography, Elizabeth shared that she was initially repelled by the idea of studying medicine. She said she had hated everything connected with the body and could not bear the sight of a medical book. My favorite studies were history and metaphysics, and the very thought of dwelling on the physical structure of the body and its various ailments filled me with disgust, she wrote. She continued to publish many books and pamphlets about health and medicine, and was involved in a number of reform movements, including moral reform, sexual purity, hygiene, and medical education, preventative medicine, sanitation, family planning, women's suffrage, and the abolition of prostitution. She died in Hastings, England on the 31st of May in 1910. I don't know if she knew about the statistics about women doctors at the time of her death, but if so, she would have been proud of the fact that in 1881 there were only 25 female doctors registered in England and Wales, but by 1911 there were 495. I hope you've enjoyed today's moment in history. If you'd like to learn even more history, please stop by my blog found at my website www.lindashentonmatchett.com. Consider subscribing to the channel and clicking the bell icon to receive notifications of new episodes that generally release on the second and fourth Fridays of each month. You now have the opportunity to partner with me in my author journey through Patreon and receive exclusive benefits not available anywhere else. Depending on the level you choose, you'll get to read along as I write, obtain advanced copies of ebooks or signed paperbacks, and attend live monthly chats. You might even get to name a character. Head on over to my page found at patreon.com forward slash Linda Shenton Matchett for more information. Again, that's www.patreon.com forward slash Linda Shenton Matchett. Thanks for watching and have a great rest of your day.